Good evening. Welcome to Talking Politics. I'm your host this evening, Mia Skanga. And tonight you're going to be meeting the three candidates who are running for Ward B. Now, Ward B encompasses West Side, McGinley Square, and a part of Greenville. As you know, the election is Tuesday, November 7th, and the polls are open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. You'll be getting your sample ballot about a week before the election. I strongly encourage you to review it because it's going to be a monster ballot. What with the gubernatorial, the freeholder, the mayor and council candidates, of which there are 35 candidates, and the Board of Ed, plus two to three referendum questions. If you find it all overwhelming and confusing, you could thank Mayor Fulop, who pushed to move the election for mayor and council to November. Uh, and also told erroneous information to the public about the cost savings. So uh, with me, I have the three council candidates. So Mira, why don't we start with you? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself sure. and why you're running? Well, good afternoon. My name is Mira Punzeri. I'm from the south side of the ward. I live over on Broadman Parkway. Mm -hmm. I have done a lot of work within the community over the last seven years, involved in a number of civic organizations and boards that touch not only Ward B, but the city in totality. Um, my friend and I started a music series in Lincoln Park. I've co-founded two farmers markets. Um, so my natural progression was coming to making the decision to run for council. I had um, put my name and my resume in for the appointment a year and a half ago, spoke with the mayor about that. Mm -hmm. Timing wasn't right. Um, this time around, the timing just seemed right. It presented itself. And I feel that with my track record of um, mm -hmm. getting work done within the ward, across the ward, um, I would be a very effective representative for okay. Ward B. Okay. And what do you do for a living? For a living, I work in the development department for a local nonprofit, Rising Tide Capital. Mm -hmm. We offer a community business academy and business acceleration courses for entrepreneurs. And we help them either start okay. or grow well, their business. Well, we can't promote them now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. We're gonna I'm sorry. Out, we're going to run out of time. <laughs> Okay, and next to you is Councilman Chris Gadsden, and he's the incumbent. Yes. And you came about because you ran last November, so you've been in office for about a year. Yeah. I guess well, John well, Halloran. 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 Yes. Halloran. John Halloran. Yeah. Halloran. John Halloran. And um, he was appointed by the mayor because Chico uh, Ramchal had been arrested in March of 2015, and then he resigned, uh, well, as part of the plea agreement, he gave up his seat as counsel. So you've been in the office for a year. So yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I'm Chris Gadsden, um, vice principal at Abraham Lincoln High School, educator for close to 20 years mm -hmm. in Jersey City. Um, I'm a civic leader. I'm part of various civic organizations in Jersey City, I'm on the executive board of the NAACP, executive board of the North Jersey chapter of National Action Network, uh, various civic groups, Royal Men. Uh, so uh, throughout my life, I've done a lot of work to help improve the conditions and the lives of many folks in Jersey City and throughout the state even. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on the council for about 11 months. 11 months. Uh, my primary focus is to make sure that um, legislation is passed. Okay, That's well, we'll talk about that okay. in a little bit. Now, Jessica, what about yourself? <laughs> Hi, my name is Jessica Hellinger, <laughs> and I'm okay. born and raised here in Jersey City, and I am looking to run for city council. And what do you do for a living? Oh, sorry. Oh, I am a licensed real estate agent and licensed mortgage professional. Okay, and you're a mother also, I'm right? I'm a mother of four. Four children, okay. Okay, cool. All right, Jessica, why don't we start with you? Um, what, what would you consider the most pressing issue facing Ward B? And if elected councilwoman, how do you think you'd go about resolving it? The most pressing issue facing Ward B. Right. What do you consider? Uh, I consider the most pressing is issue is affordable housing. Mm-hmm. Okay, and to go about, you know, changing the affordable housing, I would look at the new development that's coming on the Bayfront mm -hmm. and look to go ahead and implement within the development plans that we make sure that 50% of that go to low income, 30% to moderate, and 20% to market rent, okay, which will give the average person who is working a minimum wage job 
the ability to afford to stay in Jersey City, the ability to afford to live here, to raise a family. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. And what about you, Chris? Um, I would piggyback off of uh, Jessica, but I like to extend it and just basically say that uh, in a residential ward like Ward B, um, you know, quality of life and constituent services are, 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 are pressing. Um, you know, I'm a legislator, uh, but I spent uh, an enormous amount of time fielding um, requests for things to get done inside of the ward. And so expanding services with the DPW, expanding uh, recreational opportunities, expanding, um, you know, with our expanded police force, getting them out uh, into the streets to face some of the quality of life issues, the crime in certain areas of the ward, like on Lexington and Clinton and down in Marion and just along those areas because once we improve those, once we get the overall feel of the ward, the cleanliness of it and residents feel safe, then this residential ward um, can really be the gem that it uh, truly is. Oh, okay, fine. Mira? Well, walking the ward, I think we've all learned that these are both really very big issues, quality of life issues, affordable housing, parking is also an issue. But another thing that I've heard and that's resonated is um, the comments along our commercial corridor along West Side Avenue and Bergen Avenue. Mm -hmm. So as council person, um, I would work with small businesses to help give them the tools that they need to effectively promote their business. We have fantastic businesses along West Side Avenue. People don't really know them or want to shop there. So it would include a greening initiative to make it a more attractive place to shop, including opening up tree pits, getting um, you know the planters back in action, but also working with the merchants to see if it makes sense to start either a um, business association or piggybacking off of the McGinley Square SID yes. mm -hmm. and learn from them mm -hmm. as a way to develop a um, West Side SID because as a member and board member of WISCA that has been, or the West Side Community Alliance, okay. that's been one of our initiatives that I've been working on over the last two years. Oh, okay, fine, yeah. fine. All right. Now, critics of the administration accuse the city council members aligned with the mayor of being rubber stamps for the administration. How can you, and we'll start with you, Mira, how can you assure the voters of, vote, of Ward B that you will vote in their best interests? Great question, and a question that always comes up. It's an important question, because when you're running on a ticket, mm -hmm. You, and you're a mayor, and I'm a, mayor. I'm a mayor Phillips ticket. Right. You know, I align with him on certain issues. I think that the fifteen dollar mm -hmm. minimum wage was a very important issue to get passed through. Earned sick leave was another one, and transgender health care. So these are things that I feel are very important when it comes to other issues, especially around abatements, because I'm going to drop the A word. It's going to come up. Um, you know, you, you have to think about your ward first and what's the most important thing to the constituents. And then you have to effectively communicate to them your position and your point of view. Now, with regard to voting the same, I don't agree with the mayor on all things. And he knows that. It's come up before. And, you know, but also you need to have that collaboration and that dialogue and a little bit of the hurly-burly and the fight to sort of knock out maybe new answers that might come about with that sort of... Um, you know, discussion. So okay. that's that's how I would. All right. Yeah. And Chris, I mean, you uh, you're now with Bill Massachusetts' team, but you ran as an independent last yes. November, and I know you haven't voted with him on a number of issues. Yes. Well, you know, in the council, it's um, you know, Mayor Fuller in 2013, he came in with a majority, seven to two, a majority on the council, and that shows like that matters because a lot of the initiatives and legislation that's been passed, it's been almost um, pushed and steamrolled through. Um, what I think that the city council needs is more uh, independent-minded people on it so that we can kind of like discuss, talk about uh, legislation more in depth and uh, uh, allow for a little bit more transparency t to occur because mm -hmm. that's one of the things that's lacking. And so anyone that's a, on the Mayor Phillips um, ticket, you know, you, it, it, it's when the administration, Here's how it works. Like when the administration presents a project or a task, for the most part, you got to get as many people from the camp uh, to agree. And most of the people do. All right. So when we go into uh, a discussion, say, for example, um, uh, let's take the project labor agreement. Mm -hmm. um, we know that certain things were left out of it. Certain things were not put inside of the actual ordinance that we actually agreed to. Mm -hmm. But for the sake of just having that ordinance or legislation being passed, it just goes right through because he has the majority all the time. So 
even though I'm on a mayoral ticket, my independent streak is always there because I don't think that we should um, just push everything um, through the way, it, the way it, you know, the way it has been over the last three and a half years. And so, and yes, I disagree with the mayor on um, on a few things, but there's been a, you know some things that I you know that I can work with the mayor on. Sure. You know? Sure, that's to be expected. Yeah. Now, Jessica, you're running as an independent, right? So, what are your thoughts? I guess you know, what are your thoughts? Because we've seen independents in the past then closely align themselves with the mayor, and sometimes I think it's because they've never been to a council meeting, mm -hmm. so they just really don't know the issue. So it's safer and easier just to side with the mayor's point of view. What are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts are that I believe that our council does need to be an independent council for the people, uh, and they should not be aligned with, you know, the mayor's agenda all the time, mm -hmm. or anybody's agenda. Mm -hmm. They should have a voice of their own, and their voice should be of the people of their ward. It should be of the best interest for the people of their ward. So just like Mirit said, and Chris had said, I follow the same sentiments, you know, that I personally, as an independent, will be the voice for the people of the ward. Okay, fine, fine. All right. Now, here's a little budget question. Okay. Under Mayor Fulop, the city budget, the city's budget has gone up from uh, 2013, 2013, 516 million to in 2017, 572 million dollars. That's an 11 percent increase in four years. Under the Fulop administration in March, they celebrated their 70th tax abatement. There was a party at City Hall. I don't know if you guys saw it. Oh, I know right. Chris okay. did. Yeah. I was a part of it. But the cake, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And there's been a number of them passed since then. Now, the schools have seen more than at least 1,200 student increase just in the last two years, while state and federal funding has been cut. Yeah. And in July, state funding was cut at the last minute by $8.4 million. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, let's start with you, Mira. What do you, I mean, what are your thoughts on this abatements and the school funding and the school uh, increasing enrollment but decreasing funding? Okay, well, I think that when it comes to abatements and while, you know, taxes have stayed level and services have stayed Well, he keeps on, he keeps 95, uh, the way the tax mm -hmm. abatements work, the, the mayor no, I know, gets 95, yeah, 95 percent and the county gets five percent and the schools yeah. get zero. Well now there's the executive ordinance is giving them ten percent and okay. I think though that when you are looking at some of these yeah, things Yeah, but you everybody also else is to, paying 26, 27 percent. I understand that, uh, but, mm. but also too you also have to look at, you know, this is a, uh, why you need to have good board of education candidates and voted in because it's a combination of the two with the budget and then how the schools are run. So. Right. I, think, I understand that. I'm a, I'm a CPA by trade, okay. but I, I really think the people who run the schools know better than uh, an advisory board on how to run it. But especially when you come to the nitty gritty mm -hmm. of, of paying people and staffing mm -hmm. schools, no outside board can dictate that. Right. But also, you know, like I said, I'm from California originally, and mm -hmm. we had Proposition 13 when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So it did affect the way that schools were funded and based on tax you know, and, and, um, money coming in as well. So I think that when you're looking at the overall budget, you have to consider the different buckets and where the money's gonna go. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then just because there's, you know, an increase in one place, you still have to make sure that the money's being spent wisely. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, Chris, well, you're an well, educator. Well, well, I'm an educator and, uh, you know, I was directly infected by the $8.5 million cuts that hit the schools and, you know, with an additional cut, so I title one, uh, monies, you know, we have to find a way. Which is federal money. Which is federal money. Yeah, federal money's gone down yeah. like over 10% yeah. in the last, so with, since 2000. With the federal yeah. and state. And then, you know, moving forward next year, there's there's talks about additional cuts. So right. with Jersey City's, um, you know, tax abatements mask how much Jersey City is able, uh, you know, to pay. And the state is looking at that. The state is looking at Jersey mm -hmm. City's capacity to fund its schools, especially at a time where we're going back to local control and eventually everybody's going to say, well, you need to pay your fair share. Right. And so with the abatements, uh, one of the pieces of legislation that I'm uh, presenting this week um, is for the, um, the abatements to, to uh, help fund Jersey City Public Schools at a, at a total of about 25% of the uh, annual surcharge to go to back towards uh, Jersey City Public Schools. Now the mayor executive order is just that, it's an order. But I'm seeking 
and uh, along with the co-sponsor with Michael Young and Bogiano is to um, legislate that. Like that, that's an ordinance. It's not a uh, you know executive order. It's, it's on a, the it books. becomes it's law. law. Like yeah, it all these, law. Like every time you know a developer, they have to pay uh, annual surcharge to Jersey City Public Schools, and that's going to be increased from ten percent to twenty five percent of uh, annual surcharge. So I think that that's hugely important because, and that's just a step. That's just the beginning because eventually we're going to have to start paying our fair share of what we should be paying to educate our kids in Jersey City. Mm -hmm. That's going to be hugely important down the road. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The suburbs have had it. Right. More than 50% of their tax bill goes to the schools. To the schools. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and they just don't give out the tax abatements that we do, no. especially in such a hot market. They don't have as hot of a market as we do. No, no. Now, Jessica, what about you? Especially when you have four children in the system, right? I have four children in Jersey City Public Schools, and yes, uh, it is uh, very tasking when you see the schools in such deplorable conditions. Because they have no money to fix them. Because they have no money to fix them. And the patchwork that's being done within, within inside the schools, mm -hmm. uh, even within the materials that the children are receiving mm -hmm. to learn from. So yes, as far as tax abatements go and schooling, right now would be, it, our schools are very overcrowded. Right, right. So your thoughts are... Our schools are, are overcrowded, and right now we have more residential housing being built. And off of what Mayor Fulop has said recently, there's going to be an even larger boom of construction and development going on here in Jersey City. Oh, absolutely. So our overcrowded schools, and it's going to equal more students in our overcrowded schools, and they're going to be tax abated. So nobody's paying to repair these schools right. or to build new schools. So your, th your thought process is, if elected councilwoman, what would you do? If elected councilwoman, uh, we would definitely have to visit the factor of in increasing the amount of money that's given back to the school and the tax abatements. As right now, the legislation, 0%. right yeah. now it's zero percent. Chris right. is, no. you know, put in it. It's ten percent now, correct? It's ten percent now. Going forward for Going new forward, abatements. Yes, it has to be a minimum of twenty-five percent. Okay. All right. Fine. Now, the reval will be reflected in the August 2018 tax bill. It's been postponed uh, for years, which is astounding, and that's another story. Now, that's going to be, I think, an issue for some of the residents of Ward B, probably more the west side of McGinley Square. I think Greenville will see a, 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 a reduction in their taxes. As a councilwoman, um, Mira, what do you what do you propose? What do you think you can do as a councilwoman when these reval bills come through? Well, I think that there are things that people need to know about, like for example, the senior freeze program, and that program has been extended to October sixteenth. Mm -hmm. So they can do they can go to the state's website and they can check out that information there. I think that when the um, new valuation of the homes come in, mm -hmm. all of the residents should go talk with the organization that has done the reval to understand why the valuation in their property has changed. Mm -hmm. I think that as councilperson, then also we, there are ways that we can support residents and look to you know see how the shift are going to be made because if you take it on face value the theory is that a third will go up a third will stay the same and a third will go down right. now we're going to see bigger gym jumps in the heights and downtown because i know what i pay in property taxes and i know what friends of mine pay in different parts of the area right. and being on the south side of the ward will probably will be about the same or, or will go down a little bit right you know but in the middle right. now with the new um like the, what's happening with home prices around the park and the like you're going to see that shift as well Right, mm -hmm. right, I agree. What about you, Chris? What do you think as a council person you'll be able to do once those reval bills come out? Yeah, similar to what uh, Mira said, you know, with seniors, we've got to make sure that they're protected so they, everyone needs uh, senior citizens, you know, do the application, do the work, and get your freeze. Also, when that new tax bill come out, especially for the residents downtown and, and in the Heights and even portions of Ward B, um, we have to um, advocate for... Um, some type of amnesty because some people can see taxes going up a good five to six thousand dollars whatever in certain areas and that's kind of scary and if we remember what had occurred back in 1989 people were priced out of their homes people mm -hmm. lost their homes uh, during this time and so like we have to make sure that there's homeowner protections make sure that they had some type of amnesty maybe phasing in their taxes over the next couple of years so that they can play catch up but all these things have to be on the table as we uh, go through this um, 
you know, crisis for a lot of people here mm -hmm. in Jersey City because it's pretty scary. When right. You, yeah. That, I, I think, uh, think about it. installment plan has to be approved by the state. Yeah. 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 I think only that. Newark was able to get that done. Yeah. yeah. You're right about that. Yeah. And five years. Five I think years. they phased yeah. it in over five yeah. years. So we have, to do, yeah, we have to do work like that, whatever, just mm -hmm. to really advocate for that because a lot of people are going to be burdened by this. Right. Right. And they should, you know, if you're 65 years old as of December 31st, mm -hmm. you should apply for senior freeze like right now, right now. so you could lock in this year's taxes. Mm -hmm. yes. You do it next year, you're going to be locking in next year's taxes, exactly. not going to do you any good. Exactly. And yeah. just for those that don't know, what senior freeze does is it freezes your property tax rate at where it is for this year. So let's say you're living in an area where your property taxes go down, you can still take advantage of that. It protects right. you only if it goes, goes up. up. Right. Yeah. Right. But you have to be 65 right. as of December 31st to apply. Correct. Right. Now, Jessica? What are your um, thoughts? Well, my thoughts are, I'm going to piggyback on mm -hmm. both uh, Mira and Chris, is definitely we need to, right now, I'm not a councilwoman, but we are, you know, and I am actively going out seeking seniors to help them understand the senior freeze because they do have to apply by October 16th mm -hmm. in order for them to freeze their taxes at the current standards, especially in the people whose areas that look like it is going to go the higher route. Right. But right. I also think we also need to phase in. And I was part of NORC's uh, phasing in process. We actually, you know, uh, oh, you manage a uh, property and several properties in NORC uh -huh. and within my real estate company. So we managed properties in NORC right. and we had went through the big change. So we had a tax revalue done in NORC and our new taxes came in and on some of the property, one of our properties went from uh, $40,000 to $190,000. Wow. And that was a commercial property. A commercial yeah. property, yeah. yes. <laughs> I don't, I don't <laughs> that was a commercial wow. property, but, you know, in the same midst, we... Right. That's huge. Yes, it's yes, huge. Okay. All right. Okay. Wow, 140 to 190. Okay. Um, now, I don't know if you guys see this as a problem, but uh, where I live, which is a uh, you know pre-war building and it doesn't have a doorman or anything, we have homeless people. I mean, and I see sometimes the same people that travel from building to building looking for a place to sleep, and you feel really bad about it. But you can't have your lobby have right. you know homeless sure. people sleeping there. Sure. So, do you see that as an issue, and how do you think we can resolve it? Why don't we start with you, Mira? It, it is an issue, and you see it along West Side Avenue, not just in doorman buildings. There are a number... No, in non-doorman buildings. Oh, non yeah, yeah, we're non-doorman, non -doorman. and I'm sure in doorman buildings it doesn't happen because the doormans... <laughs> but there well, aren't that many doorman buildings there around here. There aren't that many here. doorman buildings around here, mm -hmm. and, and it will happen sometimes if there's a change in shift or something like that. Mm -hmm. you, it has, just to say it has not happened, you know, right. it, it can. Um, but along West Side Avenue, we see it actually at the farmer's market. There are a couple of people that come through, and we always sort of make sure that they're okay and figure out if we have to call emergency services. The thing about um, the homeless issues is getting these people the services that they need sure. because a lot of them are suffering from mental illness and, yes. and it's so it's, it's actually it's a much bigger issue than just you know, getting people off the street. It's making sure that they're in touch with organizations like Garden State Episcopal CDC, the St. Lucy's, Lucy's Shelter here in Jersey City that can help them sort of help themselves. Yeah, I know. There was a woman one winter I didn't even realize. She came in when I was going out, and one guy, uh, a resident here, said to me, did you just let her in? And I said, yeah. She said, well, she's homeless. And sure enough, she tried to sleep where the mailboxes are. And um, so I said to her, I went back, and I said, you're going to have to leave. I said, why don't you just go to St. Lucy? She says, they're full. They're full. And it was cold. It was a cold night. They're I said, you want me to call the police? No, don't call anybody. Right. And then she walked out with her, you know, all her Whatever. stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I felt really bad about it, but she said, no, they're full, they're full. And then someone says, you know, sometimes they don't want to go to a St. Lucy's because there's rules there. It's, yeah, I mean, you it's, know, it's, but it's, it's, it doesn't seem like there's enough it's, shelters. It's, it's, well, there's there's not, not enough there's shelters. There's not enough shelters, and shelters. there's a lot of people in need, and we see this through service projects that I do also with Rotary and the Hunger Free JC project, and there's, there's a lot of people that need a lot of help. Right. And they sleep in front of Old Bergen Church every yeah, night. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Right yeah. on the, right by the doors there. There's what somebody actually living yeah. on City Hall. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Well, I'm not stairs. surprised. And, on and the I stairs? Would, you, yeah. know, you know, I would go as far as, uh, along the working with Garden State Episcopal, like someone has to take the lead 
on transitional housing and additional housing shelters here in Jersey City. And so while the emphasis and focus is, is on development and taking properties, whether it be in the JCRA or wherever, like we need to take an allotment of property and really prioritize this issue and provide those support services because a lot of those homeless people are on the street and I talk to them regularly, they actually receive benefits, they actually have like social security, they actually have welfare, but they're living on the streets taking care of themselves, mm -hmm. right? So like we need that type of infrastructure within the city now mm -hmm. and, and, and so that they can, um, you know, make that transition into our and then that leads into the affordable housing aspect of it. You know, affordable housing, like low income, yeah, low income right? housing, so, so, low, so income. low income housing, so that they can transition into it because a lot of them have the benefits. So we got to prioritize that and build more shelters, build more transitional housing structures all throughout Jersey City. Mm -hmm. About three or four of them would will take care of a lot of the homelessness along West Side, General Square, and just all the exchange place downtown, like just a lot of the areas. We can do this in Jersey City if we just yeah. prioritize it. Okay, and Jessica? And yes, I'm in full agreements with uh, Chris and Mira, and I do work a lot with the homeless people and speak with them. And what you hear is, you know, they do have incomes coming in, but their incomes are not enough to support the rents here in Jersey City. Sure. Right. Okay, so if we do look at the low income housing, you mm -hmm. know, and implement it and build in low income housing for people who have an income, Mm -hmm. Okay, and put it on the sliding scale of their income working people, once again, with an income, we will see less people on the streets. Okay, terrific. So Jessica, why don't we start with you, uh, like one minute. Um, so why should people vote for you as opposed to re-electing Chris Gadsden? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> but uh, Well, you're in competition with each other, so they can only vote for one. So you have to make it quick. Well, people can only vote for one. Yes, that's true. So I would say they should vote for me because <laughs> the way you put it makes it, you know. I, I understand, so, but that's exactly but what you're yes. doing. You know, I you're, know. You're I voting know. for you as opposed to Chris because he's the incumbent. I'm voting for me for the factor that I'm. I mean, you, obviously, you don't think I'm you independent. Could do something better. I'm humble, okay? So I'm very humble. I'm not better than anybody, but I guarantee, I promise everybody within my ward that I will listen, okay, Dil diligently at everything that they have to say, and I will work hard on their behalf to help him make it. Okay. And what about Chris? Now, why should people reelect you? Because I'm doing the job. <laughs> and I, I think I'm doing it pretty well. Like in 11 months, I've uh, met with various community groups and trying to make sure that the ward is connected. And I've been doing that heavy lifting. And it is a heavy lifting because there's various communities, whether it be in Marion, whether it be Lincoln Park, whether it be down on, uh, along the west side of Bergen Avenue. This ward is, is extensive, right? But I've been doing that work and I've been very responsive to the residents and I've been very open with my forums and t trying to have, educate people on legislation, just being open. And my, uh, civic background, my social consciousness, everything that I bring to the table is all to protect the people of Jersey City, the taxpayer of the Jersey City. I'm not beholden to anybody, I'm not beholden to the mayor of the agenda, I'm, I'm beholden to the people's agenda. And that's why you need to elect me, because it's real important. Okay. And Mira, why should they vote for you as opposed to Chris? I provide effective leadership. I've been doing a lot of the work as a committee person over the last four years on my end of the ward. I have very good working relationships across the city and with all city agencies. And I feel that I can, you know, I'm the right person for the job to get it done. And I um, think that, and I'm ready to go. I can hit the ground running. There's no learning curve with me. Oh, okay. Well, I want to thank all of you for being on today. Thank you so much. And tell your friends and neighbors about Talking Politics. We stream off of YouTube and uh, play off of all the Comcast in, in the area, TV stations. So thank you so much. And don't forget to vote on Tuesday, November 7th. Good night.